I have worked in the addiction field for over probably close to 25 years now. And I remember very clearly listening to a preacher say that there is only one reason why people would come to know, would come to faith and then return back to addiction and sin, there's only one reason, and that is they have no fear of God. And I remember being really surprised by that. And I've thought on that many times, and I have yet to think of a reason to disagree with that statement. I know that a lot of people have asked me about things that surround that topic, and it's a very confusing topic to a lot of people, so I want to address that topic. I know one thing, it's a very scary position to consider taking with the one who holds your next breath in his hand. That's what I will say. You should not consider doing that. For the unbeliever, the fear of God is the fear of judgment and of eternal death, which is eternal separation from God. Luke 12, 5, Hebrews 10, 31. For the believer, the fear of God is something much different. The believer's fear is a reverent fear of God. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This reverence and awe is what the fear of God means for Christians, and this is what should compel us to surrender to the creator of the universe. Proverbs 1 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And until we understand who God is and develop a reverential fear of him, we cannot have true wisdom. And true wisdom comes only from understanding who God is and that he is holy, just, and righteous. Deuteronomy 10, 12, 20, and 21 says, and now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him. Take your oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. The fear of God is the basis of for you're walking in his way, serving him and loving him. The biblical fear of God includes understanding how much God hates sin and fearing his judgment on sin, even in the life of a believer. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 describes God's discipline of a believer. While it is done in love, Hebrews 12, 6, it is still a fearful thing. As children, the fear of discipline from parents, no doubt, prevented some very poor choices. The same should be true in our relationship with God. We should fear his discipline, and therefore we should try to live our lives in a way that honors God. Believers are not to be scared of God. We have no reason to be scared of him. We have his promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God. In Romans 8, 38 through 39, we have his promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. In Hebrews 13, 5, fearing God means having such a reverence for him that it has a great impact on the way we live our lives. The fear of God is respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline, and worshiping him in great awe. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, Proverbs 16, 6. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs 8, 13. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. John 14, 21. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. 2 John 1, 6. Love, fear, and obedience, when it comes to walking with God, all mean the same thing. You cannot love God without having the fear of God in you. You cannot love him without obeying his word, and you do not truly fear God unless you love and obey him. There are some that teach only the fear, that fear of God causes people to run from sin. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3, 16 to 18. And Proverbs 3, 7 says, Fear of the Lord, 
and depart, fear the Lord and depart from evil. And Proverbs 14, 27 says, the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life and to depart from the snares of death. Others teach that the only anecdote against sin is love. And there's very little preaching about the fear of God in today's church, hardly any sermons that bring conviction of sin and compromise. Instead, there's a lot of teaching about loving Jesus with all your heart, a lot of teaching about tithing, even voting, saying that we're not under the law, that we all fail, love covers a multitude of sin, love Jesus, love others, you'll be in heaven because of the death of Jesus. And it all sounds good, but there is no argument. There is no argument that the greatest commandment is to love God and love others. The problem is the difference between today's definition of what Jesus calls love. Love is not an emotion or an affection for Christ, and it cannot be fully shown through worship or preaching. It certainly can't be measured by emotions. Many Believers can sit in church and feel great emotion, cry out to God and weep, and then walk straight out of church and disobey God. And Jesus says that is not loving him. Nothing can be clearer in God's word than this. Love means obeying the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the love that Jesus is talking about. Jesus said the only kind of love that is acceptable to him is obedience to his every command, obeying his word in all things and at all times. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love, John 15, 10. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. Jesus did not have it made he did not make it any more clear loving him means obeying every command and what produces a consistent lasting obedience i am convinced that godly loving obedience comes from one source the fear of a living god obedience birthed by a true and devout fear of god is love perfected and here is some of the evidence. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know him, may know that we are in him. 1 John 2, 3-5. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And you don't hear these verses preached in too many churches today. Instead, Jesus is portray portrayed often as that meek friend who overlooks a lot of sin. And of course, he knows Often people say, God knows that I have these weaknesses. He knows that I'm falling into these temptations. And at times he, he knows that I'll fail in these certain ways. He knows I have these certain traumas. God knows that my life is hard. He knows this world is messed up. He knows my family's messed up. Why would God make it this hard for me? But the Bible says something completely different. It is saying that obedience to his commands is love perfected and the fear of God is what motivates us to obey him and that the story has nothing to do with the lists of rights and wrongs on our part, but the love and the awe, the immense amount of love and awe that he knows that we have the capacity to feel and experience by design for himself that leads us to honor and obey him simply it boils down to this if you truly have the fear of god in you then you will obey his every word and by obeying you will be loving him in the way that he says is acceptable to him if you fear the lord and obey his word in all things you won't have to keep checking your heart to see if you truly love him you won't keep trying to measure your love by your tears, your lack of tears, your attendance in church, your attendance at Christian concerts. 
you can simply rest on his word that your obedience to him is your great love in action yet on the flip side or all these ways that we think we can show our love for Jesus. We blast our worship music and sing how much we love Jesus. But if we're not obeying God's word in our daily life, all of our talking, all of our singing about loving Jesus is just soulishness. It's the flesh acting out. It's fake. It's all fake. We know it. He knows it. Everyone else knows it. We all know it. God knows it. God has commanded us to forsake the world, separate ourselves from evil companions, crucify our flesh with all of its lust and passions. Are you obeying these things? And if not, if you are continually disobeying the word that he has given you, then your worship is totally unacceptable to him. It's a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. He calls it meaningless noise. Many Christians do not take God's word seriously because they don't believe God means what he says. Did Jesus really mean what he said to his own dear friends when he told the disciples, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Luke 12, 4 through 5. Does God really mean it when he says, If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him? 1 John 2, 15. James 1, 15. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Jesus commanded us to repent. He commanded us to believe in him and in the Heavenly Father. And he commanded us to love our brother as ourselves, to forgive others, and he in turn would forgive us. If you are obeying these commands alone, to repent from your sins, which means to turn from them, stop doing them completely, to believe that the Father sent Jesus and to love and forgive your brother, then you are walking in what the Bible calls saved. You're walking in the light as you have received it. When Jesus says we're not saved by the law, he's talking about something altogether different. He's talking about our efforts to earn salvation the way the Jewish leaders were trying to do it by observing religious custom. They had 660 works of the flesh that they were trying to perform no one can be saved by works. If you don't have the fear of God, you will eventually believe that God is easy on sin. I'm going to say that again. If you don't have the fear of God, you will eventually believe that God is easy on sin. David Wilkerson said, you'll think that since he's your loving father, he'll never reject you, that you can sin all you want and keep getting up. You'll get on a merry-go-round of sin, confess, sin, confess, and you'll say to yourself, I can do whatever I want. I'll just run back to Jesus and make it right. He'll forgive me at any moment. No, it is true the thief who hung on the cross next to Jesus was saved in his dying hour, but true repentance had already taken place in him. Many today think they can cry out to Jesus just before they die, but the truth is, they will be too hardened in their sin by then. Right now you may be asking, how can I obtain the fear of God? If the fear of the Lord is the very foundation of obedience and obedience is love perfected, then show me how to lay hold of a holy fear. You obtain the fear of God just as Israel did. You learn it. Psalm 34, 11 says, Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. If you are unwilling to search out God's word to learn how he deals with sin and disobedience, then simply consider how he has judged sin in his house over the past few years. God is exposing sin in his house. He says you can be sure your sin will find you out. He is showing greed, immorality, abuse of power all over in his house lately. 
and he is showing these public dealings in his church. He is showing the iniquity. And be warned, if you're a ministry leader who isn't an obedient leader for the kingdom, please repent because God will expose you. Revival is coming and revival is starting with God cleaning his own house first. And I beg you to make the right choice for your family. Many have chosen not to do that. They have gotten a warning and they have chosen not to repent and God publicly exposed them and the family was humiliated. Please don't choose that for your family. Don't make them suffer humiliation from your pride as others have chosen to do. But if you're in the house of God, stop sinning. You have to want the fear of God. You have to seek it with all of your heart. God does not give his fear to those who are slothful and spiritually lazy. Proverbs 2, 4 through 5 says, If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Yet obtaining the fear of God is actually very simple. It begins by your obedience to him and what you already know. Be faithful to obey the truth you already have, to obey the commandments you know. God will lead you step by step in further obedience and into his holy fear. You won't have to figure out how to obey him. Obedience will come to you in a very loving, natural way. There are glorious benefits for obedience to God. Jesus has promised incredible blessings to all those who are perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. There are many such benefits. Here are three. One, you will be blessed with a manifestation of Jesus himself in your inner man. John 14, 21 says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus has given you his personal promise. If you simply love him through your obedience to him, he will take upon himself the obligation to do all these things for you. He will show you the special love that the Father has for you. He will manifest himself to you, and he and the Father will actually come and dwell within you, possessing you entirely, opening up your understanding to who God is, and filling your body, soul, and spirit with the glory of his presence. Two, you will be blessed with a unique ability to hear and know his voice. 1 John 2:27. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. When the fear of God floods your soul, when you have obeyed him, resisting the devil, fleeing lust, putting away the sin that so easily entangles you, you begin to receive the ability to hear and know his voice. You will have spiritual ears to hear and you won't need a prophet or a teacher to give you a word from God. You will be taught by the Holy Spirit. Yet any Christian who is living in sin, who walks in lust, fornication, pornography addiction, covetousness, or disobedience of any kind, abusing their position of power. They cannot hear the true voice of God. In fact, nothing they hear is of God, but is either of the flesh or of the devil. Often Christians, including ministers who are living in sin, lust-filled, sensual, bound by some wicked stronghold, they begin hearing still small voices, often lovely voices, directing them, promising them good things, big things. These voices say, God is with you. You will behold wonders, miracles, blessings, prosperity on all sides. But these things don't come to pass because these voices were not from God. It was their own fleshly desires or powers of darkness coming to deceive them. Often married believers hear from God that they need to leave their present spouse to marry another more suited for their calling. These voices were not from God. The blinding power of lust. 
Jesus said, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. John 8, 43 to 44, Jesus was saying to them, I speak plainly to you, yet you don't hear what I say. It is because your heart is filled with lust and you're unable to hear the truth. Do you want to hear from God? Then get honest with him about your sin. Lay down your lust. Let God deal with you and this soundproof wall that keeps you from hearing his voice will come down. Three, you'll be blessed with answered prayers and a fullness of joy. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will seek what you will and it will be done unto you. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 15, 7 and 11. A fullness of joy comes from hearing his voice clearly. If you will but say to Jesus, Lord, I want to walk in your righteousness, to truly love you through obedience. God promises, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they were yet speaking, I will hear, Isaiah 65, 24. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous, Proverbs 15, 29. The prayer of the upright is his delight, Proverbs 15, 8. Ask God to put a holy fear in your heart and begin to walk fully in obedience to all you know of his commands and you will be perfected in your love for Jesus Christ. Precious Lord, I am passionate to represent you well this side of heaven. You have been amazing to me and those that I love. Thank you for every single day you have given me that I should be in hell. Thank you for each one of these women that you have gifted me with that are by far the best companions that I have ever had in my life. None of us are perfect, but we are perfect together. I ask that everyone who ever hears me speak will know that Jesus Christ is Lord and is worth laying down everything in the world for, that there is nothing worth hanging on to that is worth going to hell for, that Jesus is the only one that is worth anything and he is worth everything. Holy Spirit, have your way in every life that ever hears my voice. I pray for a miracle for each one that you would just set them free from any passion that would exalt itself above Jesus Christ. I love you, Jesus, more than anything. And I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.